Tuesday, 9.47 a.m. Hi, baby. I'm Baby, you have to listen to me carefully. I'm on a plane that's been hijacked. I'm on the plane. I'm calling from the plane. I want to tell you I love you. Please tell my children that I love them very much. And I'm so sorry, babe. Um, I don't know what to say. There's three guys they've hijacked the plane. I'm trying to be calm. We're turned around. And I've heard that there's planes that have been, been thrown into the World Trade Center. I hope to be able to see your face again, baby. I love you. Bye. End of message. Well, the images I saw, the ones that, of course, uh, affected me the most were the people diving off the building when it was burning. You know, to have be put in such a desperate state, you know, it shows you the human, hu human reaction to those kinds of conditions. It just, uh, it was just revolting. And disgusting that we allowed it basically to happen. Thin Thread was a program that absolutely would have prevented 9-11. So it all went back to that program. The first time I met Bill Binney, the first thing he said to me was, I need you to know that I would never deliberately commit suicide. I thought he was being a little overdramatic, but then when I started to hear what he had to say about what our country was doing, I worried about his safety too. I wanted to make one thing very certain up front, that she could be assured that I would not commit suicide. And I said that because I knew some of the people involved in this activity, and it was a pretty serious uh, thing because people all at the highest levels of the US government were involved in all departments. So I wanted to make sure that she understood that if something happened to me, it was not suicide because I was gonna be in this with her and everybody else to the end. in central western Pennsylvania was basically the wilderness of Pennsylvania. It's out in the hills, just be in the Appalachia Hills, just before the mountains.
This is my father's grave. One time I asked him, I said, uh, in your service in wartime, uh, how many men did you kill? And he said, maybe one. So, but that's all he said. He didn't really talk about it. I think that was pretty typical of World War II veterans. They did what they had to do, and they didn't really think that that was anything different than anyone else did in World War II. Nobody thought they were heroes, they just thought they did their duty. One of the worst things about war is uh, those who started force others to be as vicious as they are to stop it. That's what I'm sure he was feeling. He just didn't want to talk about having to do what he had to do when in the, in the war. One of the main reasons we get into war is by mistakes by leadership because they're informed incorrectly or they're uninformed about events, you know, totally. So um, the, the principle I thought that I was working under was to make sure that the information that I could arrive at through the work I did uh, was informative to leadership so they didn't make mistakes. Once again, if you've just joined us, an explosion underground in the garage section of the World Trade Center in New York City has killed now three people, according to the New York Port Authority, and has injured at least 150 people. Hundreds of people, as we speak, are still being evacuated from the twin-story towers of the structure at the southern tip of Manhattan Island. There was no hope whatsoever. Trapped on 94 floors all the way up. The walls just blew in, and everybody, everything went blank after that. Walls collapsed, the furniture's down. It's a mess downstairs. The first attack on the Trade Centers in 93, that was the first thing that woke everybody up in terms of the threat of terrorism. They took truck bombs into the basement and tried to place the bombs next to the supports for the building and set them off to try to shake the building or break the supports so the building would fall. Technically, that didn't function that way, but it killed a lot of people, and CIA really did start pounding the drums across the entire intelligence community to go after the terrorism, and that's what we did at NSA. also at the same time with the explosion in the digital age, ballooning of communications in the internet and the phones, and the terrorists were burying themselves inside the ballooning communications network worldwide. So we had to, we had to face that as a new technical problem that we had to solve to figure out who was communicating with whom and who were the terrorists and try to extract that information out of that flow of information. When I first took on the duty of technical director of the World Geopolitical and Military Analysis and Reporting Shop, I pulled together analysts from all over the agency, uh, around the world. I said, okay, we're gonna start this little project here and here's what we're gonna do. We graph the relationships of everybody in the phone network in the world. So all we have to do is map all the relationship between two and a half billion phones. And somebody in the back says, oh, you can't do that. And I said, why not? And they said, because all the combinations are infinite. 
So I said, okay, think of it this way. At any instantaneous point in time, the numbers of atoms in the universe are finite. The relationship to 2.5 billion phones is simply a smaller subset of that. So that's nothing. Now you can get your mind around it. That was the whole idea of the Thin Thread program. Of all the analysts I ever knew, in my entire career, spanning from U.S. Air Force through my career at NSA, Bill was by far the most astute, um, the most capable, accurate. He used all the tools necessary not only to find the story, but to complete it. Where we weren't able to actually read messages. They were encrypted. Bill found ways to leverage indicators that I'd never seen anyone else do. Bill was Mr. Externals at the NSA. He was the person who, in the agency who knew the most about what we now call in the digital age metadata. If something was encrypted and you couldn't decrypt it, you could still get information out of the external signals. And that was Bill's forte. Bill would find ways around the encryption to see things that people didn't even look for. Able to work almost any problem, almost any challenge and draw upon mathematics and other inherent analytical skills and the willingness to be open-minded, not closed-minded. He had a good BS detector and could, he could tell when somebody was blowing smoke and, uh, and he, was, he was the agency's best traffic analyst, bar none. In 65, I was coming out of school and the Vietnam War was cranking up. That was when we still had the draft. And so people were getting drafted out of my community. And since in the country, you're usually pretty good with a rifle. And if you go into the army, you end up in the front lines doing sweeps through the jungles in Vietnam and shooting people. I simply did not want to participate in any of that at all. I even stopped hunting because I didn't like to kill animals. So why would I want to get involved with Vietnam? I had the option to volunteer for the Army to go to Europe. They gave me a whole battery of tests, and they said, uh, gee, here you have a fairly uh, high aptitude for analysis. So they said, hey, you're a prime candidate for the Army Security Agency, and they sent me to Turkey. We had just come through the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, which was probably the closest time we ever came to nuclear war. And that kind of sensitized everybody to the real threat. Turkey was looking at the southern part of the Soviet Union. They had a lot of areas where they developed military technology. I, I was working a rather large military data system, a Soviet data system that uh, had not been solved at that point. 
So they would look at things like manual Morris or speech broadcast or satellite communication. Those kinds of things produced information which they called traffic. Some of it you record, some of it you would either get directly translated or converted into character streams. Some of it would be continuously encrypted data, which you wouldn't be able to read, but you could look at durations and things like that. It was probably uh, 20th of the Russian military. So I was looking at a small segment of it, trying to develop the techniques that were necessary to see into what they were doing. It was me sitting at the desk, looking at this abstract data, struggling to understand what it really meant. As I was going through there, it became clear to me that there were mathematical patterns involved. I started to see systems and relationships, so I started building things. It was allowing me then to begin to understand and interpret the things that we were getting in terms of communications and relating that then to real world events and what was really happening in the field. When I got to that point, the whole thing started to fall in place and so then you can reconstruct the entire system, their entire system of command and control and everything they were doing. Everything is human behavior. Human behavior is extremely patterned. How do people operate? How do they interact? And how does that manifest or appear in this abstract set of communications you're looking at? It's a matter of getting to the point where you can understand the patterns and interpret them properly. When you sit there and look at a problem like that, and then you see, you can see the pattern and the in and the break. That's exhilarating when you do. It really is. Which is basically what we call metadata analysis now. Nobody seemed to be doing that. So that ended up NSA requesting me to be reassigned to NSA headquarters. I got a letter from what we termed God. It's in February of 67. Metadata is actually just data about the data. And as a traffic analyst, you don't care about what's in the conversation. You care about who's talking to whom, how often are they talking, when are they talking, what's their pattern of talking, who are they talking down to, who are they talking up to, what's the subordination, the command and control structure of the organization. In May of 68, I got transferred into the current reporting shop. In the early summer, the Russians started to training or having an exercise along the border of Czechoslovakia. I started looking at the communications they were using to move around. And that's where I started to pick out some very small number of unique things. That was different from a normal training program. So I started to capture that. And I said, it's obvious that they're going to invade. It was only two days later that they actually invaded.
That was the first occurrence that I had direct personal experience with a real world activity that let me see what was different between that and the training. That gave me the idea of what were the real warning indicators of impending action. The real warning indicators, there were only five. Five, that's all. <clears throat> Just five warning indicators. I mean, they had, they had uh, uh, you know, maybe a hundred warning indicators on the list, but none of them meant anything. The five that were real weren't even on the list. Okay, so, so I had my five and the rest of them were meaningless to me, so I simply watched for those five. And it was just case after case over time, over decades, you could see every time they were going to do something, one of these or more of these, one or two of these would show up at least. Kapoor War came along in 73. Again, those warning indicators started showing up. And then again in 79 with Afghanistan. That was about a week before that invasion. It was very close to the Christmas holiday. So at that time, I said, well, they're going to go in and close to midnight on Christmas Eve because that's when everybody's going to be asleep in the free world. So, <laughs> and that's exactly what they did. I was off by an hour. I couldn't understand why a lot of people couldn't see what I could see. I didn't look at that understanding as a uh, anything more than just a greater understanding of, of people and how they operate. I sat on the terrorism desk in the Pentagon in 1993. I was on that desk when they attempted to drop the World Trade Center towers the first time with truck bombs. That's when I first learned about Osama bin Laden. And I distinctly remember um, issuing reports in which we said, this is a serious matter. This is not a one-time event. There is a larger movement here and they're planning on doing more. Al Qaeda, the base, and Osama bin Laden as their leader weren't just issuing pronouncements, they were actually calling for action. The senior military officer, the J-2, reports to the Joint Chiefs of Staff, comes down to our alert center at, in the National Military Joint Intelligence Center. And he says, yeah, I'm reading your reports. You know, who cares about some raghead spouting off fatwas in the desert under, underneath a fig tree? Right? Who cares? Not a threat. The National Security Agency traditionally has been one of the most productive of U.S. intelligence agencies. We relied very heavily on it ever since World War II, at least. When I got the National Security Agency account, I had heard that they were in pretty good shape. I went for, an in for intensive rounds of briefings, and after about three months, I was shocked at the poor condition of the agency. We were very ill-prepared for the digital age, but National Security Agency management continued to think that they were the best in the world and had the best technology that, because this had always been their reputation. And they were convinced that there were no fundamental problems. I was convinced that there were fundamental problems, both technical and especially cultural. And I became very worried very quickly. 
See, they were drowning in garbage. The processes that were in place before ThinThread came along were, were wild-carded garbage collectors. And they were dumping all this stuff into a huge storage system. And the analysts were floundering trying to find out, well, you know, what's important to me? ThinThread was our way of trying to address the digital age. It was a question of being able to manage the volume of data. The terrorists are using all the cell phones, all the landline phones, all of the internet connections to communicate. So the new Cold War, if you will, was the worldwide explosion of the digital age. NSA took the different perspective that says let's just collect everything and then we'll have our analysts figured out later. The problem is once they collected everything your analysts couldn't figure it out. There was too much they couldn't get through it every day they make their database polls and they've got hundreds of thousands of returns. Well you could not get through it. You're burying your analysts with meaningless data. That's when I started uh, looking at what we had to do to solve the problem of the volume of data and how could we isolate things that were important for our analysts to look at. And the key was metadata. Just using the metadata in terms of relationships across the network. So you don't have to look internally at the content, you look more at the relationships. Uh, of the people communicating or organizations communicating in the world. Uh, so that's the way you can see into large amounts of data fairly quickly, effectively, and pull out data that's relevant to targets you want to analyze. My biggest fear throughout all of my work at NSA was the fear of human inaccuracy and human failure in terms of interpreting things properly or in terms of uh, recognizing things. I felt that that process needed to be fully automated as much as possible so that the information coming in was untouched by human hands. Many people called me things like the great Satan or, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the evil one, I think, uh, and many other names, you know. So I had whole groups of people that didn't want to talk to me or be involved with me because they felt if they did, they would lose their jobs. I was sitting at my desk with pencil and paper, trying to build a structure of the Soviet military command and control system. Of all the forces, in order to do it, I needed a little help from the cryptologists. So I went to them to get the bits that they had in possession. And they came back with a minuscule answer. And, and I said, if you don't want to work this problem, just give me the bits and I'll do it. I couldn't wait for them. For a nuclear intercontinental ballistic missile to be fired, it takes no more than 30 minutes to go from one continent to the other. That means whether or not you wish to fire back before the weapons start landing, you have 30 minutes to make that decision.
it was at a point in time where the civilization could wipe themselves out in an hour by nuclear exchange. For the longest time in my career there at NSA, I was trying to work, you know, this is probably the order of 13 years, I was trying to work with the computer people because I wanted them to do certain programs that would assist me in what I was attempting to do. Every time I would ask them to do something for me, they would say, okay, please send us a memo saying you have this requirement request. So I'd send them memo after memo that gave them a requirement. That requirement gave them the justification to go to Congress or others internally in NSA and ask for money. So that helped them build their empire, you know. But in the meantime, they would never solve my problem. They would just take the money and uh, keep asking me for another requirement. So one time in 1983, miraculously, this PC came up on my desk. I had a friend who was probably the best C language programmer at NSA. His name was Bill, too. And I said, Bill, what do you think we could do with this PC? If I could get an algorithm together, do you think you could program that into this two disk drive 64K RAM PC? He says, yeah, I think I could do that. I said, great. So you would type in the query from unresolved issues out of the database. up would pop the answer. Where the mainframes, eight acres of computers, could not figure out what this data was. I would take it and put in my little two disk drive PC and get the answer right away. So I had to tell the computer people, and I said, you know, I have this little program down here. You might want to see this. I had this printout from the database, and I was going through it. See, it didn't resolve this here. Watch this here. And I type it into my little PC, and up would come the answer. And there's another one, I'd type it in there, and up would pop the answer. I started sweating, I could see. And I said, don't you think that's neat? He said, yeah, don't you think that should be in the mainframe? I said, sure, I think it should be in the mainframe. Why don't you send me a memo, and I'll give it to you? <laughs> I thought that was great. In this process, of course, I learned very simply put, if you want something done, you have to just go do it. You never ask for permission, only ask for forgiveness, if you have to. In the end, sometimes you don't have to. Once you solve the problem, it's no longer a problem. My philosophy was very simple. If somebody says that something is impossible, that's something you have to do. It's like open-ended thinking. You don't bound your thinking. You let it float anywhere it wants to go. So that gives you the idea of how you can be creative in any environment. And so I, that's what I was after, being creative anywhere I went. And that's what the SARC, the Sigan Automation Research Center, was all about. was this Skunk Works organization, about a dozen people. Bill Binney was one of the co-founders of that. Ed Loomis was the integrator. Kirk Weeby at that time was one of the, was like a business manager and analyst, and they had other, uh, other support people as well. And they had a few contractors. The Sark prided themselves on having a very small team that was very creative and flexible. They didn't want a lot of bureaucracy. They had so low a profile that when I asked for a briefing from them, the management didn't even know about them. 
and they had to scramble to find out who they were. They were kind of hiding until they had their system perfected. It was an extraordinary organization. And Bill, he was the algorithm brain. He was the crypto mathematician behind the algorithms of what became known as Synthread. People are telling me, you got to fear Bill. And the reason you have to fear Bill is that he's like this super crypto mathematician. And if there's anything wrong, he'll shred you. So I end up calling him up. We, we made arrangements to meet, and I end up showing up in his office one morning. I spent a couple hours with him, and it was immediately clear within the first 15 minutes that we were going to hit it off really, really well. Because the entire first part of our conversation was all mathematically based. The thing that Bill loves most is math. As soon as anybody raises anything mathematical, his eyes literally light up and he perks up and he'll start talking about it. You know, he just loves math. And it's, it's wonderful that he found his profession, you know, the thing that he was really meant to do. The beauty of math is that it's an attempt to structure common sense and consistencies in the universe. That's all it is. There is no chaos. There is nothing that's infinite. Everything is structured. And it's just a matter of finding that structure. I basically envisioned the graph as a very large globe of the Earth, say. With a total of about seven billion nodes in it, or dots. Each representing an individual. And uh, having all the connections of all those individuals with all the other connections they have anywhere in the world. Think of yourselves as drifting into the globe. So you're going inside the globe and you can go to any point in the globe and look at any given point to see the relationships they have with all the other dots in the globe. When you go into the globe, you pick out a dot, you can pull it out of that relationship graph, and with it will come all of the nodes that it has a relationship with. When you pulled that node out in its community, if you will, the social network it had, you pulled all of the backup data that created those uh, relationships to begin with, so that you could now timeline those relationships and see the interactions over a period of time, whatever you want to define. So that's, that's how I envisioned the graph. My interest was in making Bill Binney happy. And Bill Binney is a traffic analyst. So my focus was really on creating the metadata for him that he could do his traffic analytic thing. You can extract an awful lot about a person's life just by looking at metadata. And uh, today, when you take the uh, all the metadata that's that's being popped around the world by GPS, by your cell phones, by your uh, uh, transponders for your Easy Pass on the highways, by your credit card when you when you insert it into an ATM machine or when you insert it into a 
cash register, a checkout line. All that data gets all brought together and it all traces back to you, the individual. It doesn't matter what you said in a, an email or what website you went to or what you downloaded. What matters is what pattern your digital behavior is taking and what fingerprints does that leave of what you've been up to. I first started to build on my portion of what I considered the thin thread program, which was the back end for analysis of the data once it was acquired. Ed was doing the front end, doing the sessionizer, or getting the uh, data together and assembling it for me to look at. Ed Sessionizer was our starting point to access and scan the internet for important information. I was convinced that the internet was the uh, new way of communications for terrorists and criminals, and we knew at that point that some of them had been moving that way. The internet exploded. The NSA was actually playing catch up. They were so way behind the time. NSA management seriously considered no kidding as to whether or not they would actually give people email technology. And the reason is they, we don't know what they're going to send to each other. And there were no secrets worth knowing on the internet. It's all open. It's not secret. There's no effort. We, we, we want real secrets. We don't. Internet, you can't have a secret on the internet. In about 1996, I believe it was, we discovered Osama bin Laden's Inmarsat phone number. And so we used that to follow his motion, his movements and his intentions from 96 to 98. Until uh, uh, someone compromised the fact that we had his specific phone number and he gave the number. And so after that, we lost that as a source of intelligence. More than 80 dead, more than 1,700 injured in two bomb blasts today, which exploded just minutes and 450 miles apart. Those explosions set to go off at the U.S. embassies in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, and Nairobi, Kenya, were clearly a part of someone's war against the United States, although it is still unclear at this hour who our enemy is. There was smoke and debris everywhere. We immediately left the office because we didn't know what had happened. And uh, there were people laying about and everybody that we came to was just uh, covered in blood. We're joined now from the White House by U.S. National Security Advisor Sandy Berger. Was this a failure of U.S. intelligence? Well, the investigation is going on. I don't believe that's the case. And I think it would be inappropriate for me to, to comment on uh, what we know, what we don't know. In August of 1998, we successfully got our session under running at the fiber optic rates. Ed gave a copy of that sessionizer to our friends out at Bad Eibling, one of our echelon sites for collecting data in southern Germany. We just wanted to say, here, why don't you try there and see what you think and give us some feedback. And he said, gee, uh, this sessionizer looks really great and works really great, he says, you know. I think I'll put it on the whole site. They put it on their system Friday night. And when they did that, it started producing so much information and feeding it back to NSA that by Saturday morning it was about to crash the entire storage system inside NSA. There was too much data coming in. They couldn't handle it. 
we were told it was bringing the storage system to its knees and we were to turn it off. So one of the programmers had to come in over the weekend and turn off the sessionizer. This particular test clearly showed that there was so much more data there that was uh, much more valuable as a source of information than anybody realized at NSA. This was kind of a wake-up call that I thought made it clear to them that they needed to open up their thinking to a much larger scale than they were thinking at. I had heard about Bill Biddy, but hadn't actually met him. I called him up. I said, Bill, can I come down and see you and what your organization are doing? He said, sure, come on down. So I go down, I join Bill Biddy in the SIGINT Automation Research Center. And I look around and as I meet these guys and talk to them and interview, find out who's doing what and begin to see the results of their efforts, I become literally excited. In terms of facing the challenges of big data, digital communications and the internet, I saw the answer right before me. This little research organization had the keys to NSA's future. My concern immediately was, does anybody else know that? Do they even recognize, does anybody in any position of influence or power even recognize what they have? I was aware of the technology that went into Thin Thread from 1997. I got a formal briefing from Bill and Ed and their team, and I thought it was pretty impressive compared to what else I had heard at NSA. I thought it looked very promising. I started giving them money, and I would get Congress to agree to make sure that they were funded to develop their systems. Because the agency was admitting they had to update to the digital age from the analog age, they had not started it yet. And even under the analog systems, there is this deluge of data coming in. And once you get the digital data and you get these high capacity pipelines, it was going to be far worse. So it was going to, it was going to be essential that there was some way to pick out the targets out of this, some way far better than the keyword system that NSA was using at that point. Shortly after the bad eyebling test, we had the whole system running. And then from there on, we just took in more and more data of large numbers of phones and large numbers of computers. We started consolidating that into my big graph, which we called the big ass graph. We started pulling in such a massive amount of data and the system was working so well we could see no limit to it. Building relationships between billions of people. I mean, we're talking trillions of transactions. It was pretty clear that we were building 
the most powerful analysis tool that had been developed in history to monitor basically the entire world in near real time. This is monitoring every member of the population automatically. You, you invade everybody's privacy. That's not compatible with a democracy. That simply just does, is not compatible. That's like the Stasi on super steroids or the KGB on super steroids, you know? This is things that they couldn't even dream of. That's where I, in particular, said we have to do something to protect the individuals here, especially those who are innocent of, and of any wrongdoing whatsoever. There's no reason to, to, to even have this data that, about them. General Hayden came on as a new director of NSA. By that time, the Congressional Intelligence staff had become very disillusioned with NSA's ability to manage modernization. He was somewhat forthcoming in the sense that he was willing to make changes, although not necessarily in the areas that Congress was focused on. And he was a very fast talker. When he would brief the members, he would talk very rapidly. He would use all kinds of similes and analogies and everything that left you scratching your head while he plowed ahead. And he would get by with a lot that way. A lot, I think the members, this being a difficult enough topic to understand to begin with, he left the members in the dust. When Michael Hayden came in as director of NSA, one of the first things he said was the NSA was going deaf and blind. So he created the NSA Transformation Office, the NTO. A friend of mine became the chief of the NTO, and he realized what we were doing with Thin Thread, and he thought that was great. So he sent his deputy down, and he said, um, what can you guys do with $1.2 billion? Well. To be offered all of a sudden 1.2 billion was flabbergasting. You know, it was kind of hard to deal with. We had been operating with uh, just a couple million dollars. So we asked him to give us a little bit of time to try to figure out what we might be able to do with that. So when he came back in, we said we could upgrade the entire world, everything we have in the world, and everything back here in the United States. But in the process, we could only spend uh, maybe a little over $300 million to do it. So he said, that's really great. A few days later, he comes back down. He says, you guys did such a great job with $1.2 billion offer. Now what can you do with $1.4 billion? It was very shortly after that that um, my friend in the NTO was replaced. He was basically fired. And... Uh, Hayden proposed a program called Trailblazer. And that was a multi-billion dollar program that was going to be basically outsourced and run by contractors and developed by contractors. When NSA started on Trailblazer, I asked them if they would send down the design paper and let me read it. After I read it, I called NSA and I asked if I could speak to the Trailblazer management. And I said, I want to make sure I understand this paper. I said, from what I understand, to modernize digitally, what you want to do is start with your analog system and evolve that into a digital system by putting out one part at a time and upgrading and adding more parts. And they said, yes, that's it exactly. And I said, it will never work. 
It's a non-starter. It will never work. Why would we start from outmoded analog technology and try to evolve that into digital technology? It just, it made no sense. You ought to go with a new modern digital technology from the outset. One of the reasons that I supported Thin Thread was that I thought it was far more innovative and much more simple and elegant in design than what they were considering, therefore probably posing fewer problems. From our test with our big ass graph, it was pretty clear to us that we had to protect privacy rights of individuals. So we devised a way to build in protections and make it possible to encrypt all their attributes so you couldn't tell who they were and you couldn't analyze what they were doing because you couldn't identify them. And in cases where they weren't even in zones of suspicion, which we would define within the graph, their data wouldn't even be taken in and so that no one would have an opportunity to abuse their privacy. This is also metadata coming in. The FISA filtering tool that we had filtered out any American citizen or party that was in America unless, unless it was a specific target but even then, you would have to get a warrant to reveal the identity. By 2000, we had it all connected uh, and everything together and running from one end to the other. In 24 hours a day in three different sites, focused on Asia. The only sites that agreed to uh, cooperate with us were those sites that were known as research sites. You know, I, I never called it a test site, but I mean, they were existing sites, I mean, and they were producing intelligence from that for a long period of time. We went to NSA and asked for a briefing. The SARC team came in, and to my great surprise, the entire Trailblazer team came to the briefing uninvited. Bill and Ed started the briefing. It, what was astounding was that it went all the way from the point of collection all the way through reporting, and including automated reporting. So I turned to the Trailblazer people. Are you going to incorporate this into Trailblazer? Wouldn't this help you? And they were pretty much noncommittal and stony-faced. Um, and it turns out the SARC got in a lot of trouble for this after I and other congressional staff left. General Hayden called in the entire SARC team, lined them up in his office, dressed them down, berated them without letting them have a chance to speak, and then issued a durgram telling the entire NSA that once a corporate decision had been made, that they were not to undermine it with Congress. In other words, they were to cover up any adverse information. It was, to me, a an absolute clarion call to keep to Congress in the dark. I thought it was very brazen. General Hayden basically said, 
thin thread was no contribution to the Trailblazer program. Trailblazer is the program, and then we're not going to have any other program. Thin thread, in my view, once we had it all together, solved all the problems of volume, velocity, and variety. We had solved all those problems uh, that they were claiming were, were problems. But they rejected it as even uh, a risk mitigation process. I mean, that's the kind of experience I had with generals back in 1968, when the, the, just prior to the Tet Offensive, we were predicting uh, that offensive two months in advance. Some people came to me and uh, showed me some reports on activity in Vietnam. And they said that they were preparing a major offensive that would go from the Delta all the way up North Vietnam. And it was all reported to all the major commanders in the field as well as the Pentagon and everybody. But uh, nobody in the position of authority paid attention to it. General Westmoreland was again saying to the people in the United States that we were winning. We're watching the situation carefully, and I'm confident that any further initiatives can be blunted. I basically looked at that as a philosophy of the arrogance of power. They felt they had so much power that they were invincible. I had friends who were stationed in Vietnam. One colonel um, that I knew had a battalion stationed on the road from Saigon to Cambodia, which was a major point of attack. He, of course, had the reporting too, so he had 50% of his men in the trenches all the time, 24 hours a day, until the attack. He was ready, and he lost one man on the first day, and he stopped them cold. The problem was that all the forces on either side of him had fallen back because they couldn't hold their position on the line because they weren't ready. They didn't listen to the intelligence. So he had to eventually withdraw. The point was, if they were ready, that offensive would have gotten absolutely nowhere. But they didn't pay attention. This was a deceitful and treacherous act by the enemy. We thought they were all idiots. I thought every general in the, in the country should be fired after that offensive. All of them. They should have been drummed out of the service. I mean, we got rid of generals and all that during World War II for very similar kinds of negligence. So I don't understand why we didn't get rid of them then. In terms of Americans, I think there were a little over 2,000 lives lost in that offensive. That doesn't count how many were wounded. Well, I looked at it as they were treating us as just simply meat on the line. You know, throw more meat on the line. We begin our special coverage tonight with the latest on the terror attack against the U.S. guided missile destroyer Cole. The Navy says it has recovered the bodies of seven sailors and is searching the mangled interior of the ship for ten more. About 35 other sailors were injured. In dreary weather fitting the occasion, the first bodies of sailors killed aboard the Cole arrived in Germany this afternoon. The blast which took their lives is estimated to have been caused by several hundred pounds of explosives in a new and deadly terrorist tactic. Immediately after the attack, there was nothing left of the small local harbor craft which the Navy says had carried the explosives. 
Despite instability in the immediate region, the strategic port of Aden has been used as a refueling stop for two years, and the coal was on a heightened state of alert. But there was no defense, it seems, against suicide bombers in a small boat. We decided to continue developing thin thread to try to ensure that we had something that would functionally work by the end of 2000 so that we could address the terrorism problem in the real world, not in the, uh, in the wish world of Trailblazer, for example. That's when I went to our terrorism analysis center and said, okay, what sites do you have that will uh, that produce any meaningful information for you to analyze the terrorism targets around the world. And so they gave me a list of 18 sites, and so I took that as the target set to go against terrorism. And then I came in November of 2000 that, and made a proposal that we do a deployment of thin thread to those 18 sites starting in January of 2001. But it came back rejected. So I don't know exactly who rejected. I assumed it was the chief of SID, Marine Beginsky. She was the third person in rank in the agency. There was the director, the deputy director, then her. General Hayden hired Bill Black to come in and take over the deputy directorship. Once Bill Black was brought in from SAIC, where he had been a vice president, the following spring, he brought in another senior vice president from SAIC, and that person was Sam Visner. And who gets the contract to develop Trailblazer? SAIC. What's wrong with this picture? SAIC was a private company, is made up basically of retired NSA individuals. People from NSA retire and they'll go into a company like SAIC, and then they'll use their contacts back at NSA to get contracts back to SAIC. So when Sam Visner came in to take over the uh, NSA Transformation Office, uh, the first thing he did was to call me to his office. So I went up to his office to talk to him, and when I went in there, the uh, senior developer for the Trailblazer program was there. And the first thing uh, Sam told me, he said, I, uh, I do not want you briefing Thin Thread to anybody again. And the reason he said that, of course, was because we had already set up an appointment to brief Charlie Allen. He was the senior collection officer for the intelligence community, so he had a lot of influence. So I asked him if he wanted me to cancel that appointment and he said, no, no, don't do that. You go ahead and finish that briefing. I said, okay, I'll do that. When Charlie Allen got in, in there, the first thing he sat down and said to us, even before we started to, to show him anything about Thin Thread, he, see, he said, I hear you have a cheap trailblazer here, and I'm here to see it. Well, I mean, I had been invited Marine Beginsky to come up because Marine knew Charlie Allen. They were friends for a long, they had known each other for a number of years, I think. And uh, she was there, and she said, at that point, she said, uh, yes, Charlie, uh, but we still need the money. That was the end of our briefing of Thin Thread. On August 20th of 2001, uh, Maureen Beginsky called me and asked to speak with me and Bill Binney uh, at 4.30 in the afternoon that day. And uh, she said to meet her in her office. So Bill and I went down to her office and it was in this meeting with her that she advised us that she was terminating Thin Thread. Uh, she said the, her decision um, was made because uh, she had to decide whether or not she wanted to make um, six people unhappy or almost 500 unhappy. So she to chose to make the six people unhappy. So her, her decision was what I basically called happiness management. They are 
They're letting us stay up. I'm not sure why. Newark is allowing us to stay up. We're only the news helicopters are allowed up out of the entire country. We're like five people in the air. That's it. Oh my God, what's going on? It's like the side of the building just blew out, Chet, on the other side. The side we can't see. Look at it. On 9-11, um, I had taken my father-in-law to the eye doctor for an examination, so I was sitting in the waiting room uh, watching television while he was getting examined. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> that's when I saw the first plane hit the, hit the tower uh, in New York. And immediately that said to me that we as an agency had failed to give warning of, uh, of this terrorist attack. When my father-in-law was done with his examination, I took him home and then tried to get back into NSA to see what I could do uh, to maybe help uh, uh, help in getting information about who did this and all. Um, and they wouldn't let me back in simply because the di director uh, Hayden had sent everybody home that wasn't re necessary for the job. And so the guards were keeping everybody out so we couldn't get back in that day. So the day after 9-11, I came in dressed like I was going to sweep the floor, so the guards let me in. Otherwise, they would have kept me out then, too, because uh, that day that uh, uh, General Hayden had ordered everybody out of the building, too. So when I got in there, I got, went up to the SARC, and um, uh, while I was in there trying to look at the material in my, on my computer, why uh, uh, my uh, contracting, president of the contracting uh, group that I had working on ThinThread, came over to me and said that he'd just been in a contractor meeting with Sam Visner. And in that meeting, uh, Sam Visner had told him that uh, he said to him, do not embarrass large companies. You do your part, you'll get your share. There's plenty for everybody. And he also said that Sam had said that uh, we could milk this cow for 15 years. We began to go out to the workforce. And I would accompany Marine Baginski. The workforce took this extraordinarily hard. People would ask her, what are you gonna do? And I still remember her saying, 9-11 is a gift to NSA. We're gonna get all the money we need and then some, direct quote. Nine Eleven is a gift to NSA. All she saw was dollars coming from Congress, and we would get to spend freely. It was not what we were supposed to be about. It wasn't about making money. It was about protecting the the country and the free world. It wasn't, uh, you know, 
wasn't how much how big of an empire we could build or how much money we could make, you know? It was just sickening. In uh, late September, or early October, we uh, we and the Sark were watching as all this uh, equipment started coming in and piling up in the hallways and outside the Sark and inside the Sark in the walkways between the uh, partitions for the desks. We knew something was going on because of all this equipment coming in. And then later on in uh, early October, it started to disappear. I mean, they were assembling the hardware somewhere down the down the uh, corridor, a little bit down from where we were. Um, and then by uh, mid-October, the second week in October, uh, some of the people who used to do the, who I had under contract to do the software for us in SARC came to me and said that, uh, uh, you know what they're doing down there, and, and uh, they're taking and in data on every U.S. citizen in the country. To do the uh, spying on U.S. citizens, they had to use the only software that managed large-scale operations, which was the software that I put together, which is the back end of ThinThread, the part that does the graphing and the management of information indexing to the graph. And one of the first things they did uh, to make that process work efficiently, of course, according to them, was to remove all of the encryption algorithm that we, algorithms that we put into it um, uh, to protect this, the privacy rights and the identity of U.S. citizens or any other citizen in the, that database. Well, I mean, after I, just, uh, I was told that they were pulling in all this data on U.S. citizens and uh, basically graphing the relationships of all, every U.S. citizen that uses a telephone or anything electronic, why, uh, it was clear to me that I had to leave the agency. I couldn't stay there, so I had to get out as fast as I could. Bill, Ed, and Kirk became so disgusted with all the resistance they were getting and with some of the personal attacks on them, I think, also, that they decided to take an offer to retire at the end of October. And they told me that they planned to do that. Our last breath at NSA was October 31st, 2001. Halloween day, kind of fitting. After 9-11 and after we left, Tom took over running ThinThread. And um, he said, well, let's take the software in ThinThread and run it against the database that we've accumulated inside NSA to find out if there's any information that behind 11 attack that we should have known about but didn't. We let it run. It was somewhere around 24 to 36 hours. I remember my program manager coming back with the initial results. And they were just devastating. We discovered critical intelligence, Al-Qaeda and associated movement intelligence that had never been discovered by NSA. They didn't even know they had it in their databases. but also the specific details of numbers and movement and times and locations, travel. And you're seeing the dispersal patterns that occurred after it happened. You're also seeing that there was parts of the plot in which they weren't successful. There was multiple planes that had been targeted. And for a number of reasons, those particular planes were not actually hijacked. You can imagine the horror of realizing what had not been discovered and the confirmation of what, had, what was known sitting in these databases. 
What if this was discovered prior to 9-11? We had the information in the databases. NSA's response completely shut the program down. would have been avoided. We would have caught the people uh, who were communicating from San Diego with people abroad, with known terrorists abroad. There was no way we wouldn't have caught that. After Ed and Kirk and uh... I left NSA, we formed a little company, a consulting company uh, we called Entity Mapping LLC. We decide to try to bring the concepts of FinThread to other agencies in government and bring it to the U.S. government through another door. We were requested by the Senate Intelligence Committee staffer to go to the National Reconnaissance Office. They manage all the satellites and reconnaissance kinds of missions. We were working there on a program, but uh, NSA found out about it. They got the whole program terminated. And then we went to Customs and Border Protection. They got us fired from that one. Bill and Kirk were just infuriated by every time we went to get a contract with uh, a promising customer, at the last minute, it'd be shut off. It happened with INSCOM, it happened with the Pentagon, it happened with NRO, it happened with CIA. We are stopped at each one of those, even though we are successful. OK, I think we got it. Yeah. Including one where we were given a set of data and asked to analyze even though NSA had already analyzed it, we found extremely valuable material in that data where NSA had not. We wrote up a report, sent it up the chain. A senior executive in that agency said, my God, these guys are going to embarrass Michael Hayden and the people at the fort. We have to stop this program. And it stopped immediately. We were told stop work don't do anything else. And they proceeded to dismantle the computers that we were working with and the data that we had discovered and all of the intelligence was wiped off the disks. NSA attempted to keep the principles of thin thread being applied anywhere in the US government so that no other agency in the U.S. government could take advantage of it either. So in essence, they wanted to keep uh, the U.S. population and the free world's population vulnerable, which is what they did. And that's why we uh, filed the DOD IG complaint in September of 2002 against NSA for corruption, fraud, waste, and abuse. Kirk drafted up a very strong uh, fraud complaint, and we said, let's go with it. And, and Diane was also a party to this as well. She, she agreed to go along. So there was Kirk, Bill, Diane, and myself. And then, uh, and then Kirk was actually floating this by Tom Drake. I, I was not aware that he was, but he was sharing it with Tom Drake. And Tom, since he was still working at NSA, said that he would support us from the inside. I had access to critical information that clearly NSA was hiding. Because of all these investigations that were ongoing, NSA said, let's find where the skeletons are, capture it all, and then bury the report as deep as possible. This was actually something that Bill Black, the deputy director, was doing. And the order went out, no one will ever see that report. We can't show anybody what Thin Thread discovered that we hadn't discovered. 
We can't show Thin Thread had confirmed what was clearly a failure. So I was contacted officially, and arrangements were made for me to meet with the investigators. And so the DOD IG's office took that investigation on with about 12 investigators, and it took them about two and a half years to do it. They finally published their report in, I think it was January of 2005. Uh, and at the time, about 98% of it was redacted because it was so damning to NSA. Many of the redactions are on paragraphs that are marked unclassified. So it, it was clear to me that uh, the dirty laundry was, uh, was blackwashed. This was our Justice Department covering up for those crimes. In 2005, Trailblazer was declared an abject failure, having wasted billions of dollars. A lot of millionaires were made during that time, but not much intelligence got done. It was the largest failure in NSA history. People don't realize that. And yet General Hayden, who presided over the largest failure in NSA history, was promoted to a higher position of authority, made deputy director of uh, national intelligence, and then promoted again and made director of central intelligence. It is odd when mankind promotes failure. Something is wrong. On the 26th of July of 2007, uh, the FBI decided to raid four people. That was uh, Kirk Weeby, Ed Loomis, Diane Rourke, and myself. So they fabricated evidence to get a warrant signed by a judge to uh, go in and raid our houses and take our material. Specifically, they were after all material that was related to Thin Thread. My son answered the door and let them in, and they came in with their guns drawn and pushed him out of the way at gunpoint and came into the bedroom where my wife was getting dressed and pointed guns at her and then came into the bathroom where I was taking a shower and pointed a gun at me. I didn't hear them at first, apparently. By the time I heard them, it sounded like they were going to break down the door. They were rattling it madly and banging it back and forth. When the raid occurred here, it was such a shock to my, my inner core. I couldn't believe it was happening. I went to call my attorney first. She told me to ask for the affidavit that justified the raid. I asked them, they said it was classified and I couldn't see it. As soon as I got off the phone, I realized they had gone to the office and picked up all the most relevant information, all of the stuff about NSA that was on the shelves which was, I think, a first indication that they had entered the home previously. When all that equipment was taken from my house, my computers, my data, my newspapers, my memorandums that I had shared with friends of mine, I, I, I just could not believe that I was perceived as, as an enemy by my own country. I, I think, I keep thinking if this happened to us and we were educated people, sophisticated in government ways, uh, who could get some help, what happens to the man on the street? What happens to the 18-year-old kid?
when I found out that uh, all the things that we were doing as a result of that 9-11, um, and uh, I heard uh, Vice President Cheney's statement about we have to go to the dark side. I, I, I looked at it as a total destruction of our society, and we lost all moral standing in the world as a result of going to the dark side. It was just sad. Still is.